I am TJ Kopcha, and I am a pro assistant professor at the University of Georgia uh, in the program of Learning, Design, and Technology. And um, DBR, uh, well, I just had my conference uh, on design-based research, and I'm right now working with my doctoral student um, to do a DBR project on geometry and uh, gaining different perspectives on space and shapes and things like that. Very Our, our field, ed tech as a field, I think is still new to the idea of design-based research. Uh, what it is, why it's valuable, why it's valid, and, and what it has to offer in terms of rigor um, that may not look the same as some of the more traditional forms of research that we see, uh, but has its own form of validity and, and rigor. So that's sort of where I think it is for our, our field in particular. I think it's more widely accepted outside of our field. Uh, I, I'm not sure it's even a, a question of if it's good enough in other fields. It's just accepted that this is what it is. And other fields have been working on this idea for a long time. Uh, math education in particular, that's where a lot of the, the origins of it um, are, at least uh, when you saw that we were talking about that rash of, of literature that came out, there was an ed researcher special issue and things like that. Paul Cobb is one of the key uh, people in there. Jared Comfrey was one of the key persons in there. Chandra was part of the, the DBR collective and that sort of thing. So I, I think that um, I think the reason for that is because, and I was a former math teacher and I've done math professional development, um, the classroom is really complex and there's this, this, this integration that happens of the social cultural things that are happening and they wash together with the psychological things that you're trying to do as a professional developer or even working with children and forming um, mathematical concepts. And I think mathematicians in particular sort of focused in on that uh, a long time ago because they were struggling with why new approaches to teaching math weren't working. So they had to dig into it a lot more than we did. Uh, so for me, I'd really like to draw on those ideas and, and my own math background and the math educators who have worked on this and pull that into our field a little bit because I really do see a lot of value. Sometimes the sense I get is that we think we figured it all out 20 years ago and there's nothing left to do. Uh, and so not only is that bad for my career, because if we figured it all out, then what am I doing? Um, but I, I don't think that's true. I think there's a lot to be learned um, because you've got that thread of technology that undercurrent where every time it changes, uh, people have new questions. And I know you'll hear this, and even from me you'll hear this, a lot of times it doesn't mean that the learning has changed, but things have changed, the context has changed. And sometimes, sometimes I think we've drawn our conclusions that learning is learning no matter what the technology, I think we draw that off the idea of what works instead of what didn't work not pretending that we know ahead of time that we should see we should see a result because of the way we've embodied theory but to question whether the way we've embodied that theory will actually lead to the results we expected and that's what you see a lot of like the Sandoval article that came up um, that's that's sort of the gist of that is like we don't know when we embody theory what the result will be and sometimes we get big surprises and those big surprises are important for theory building uh, so that's where I'd like to see ed tech come to and embrace. Jonathan talks about failure analysis. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot, there's a lot to know about your own failures and, and why things don't work uh, as much as why they do work. And we are so focused on what did work that we're missing an opportunity. Things are chaotic and complex and no matter how you design it, when you put it into a context, there's an emergence of, of, of things expected and unexpected. And sometimes the unexpected are more important than the expected. So this came up a couple times here and I've heard it from, from Jim Klein, a bunch and other people. You know, a good dissertation is a done dissertation, which I don't disagree with. But a done dissertation that you have no emotional connection to or passion for is not a useful dissertation to you in the future. And so there's, there's a line to be drawn there 
and I, I think DBR helps draw that line. I think there are doable studies in a DBR framework, whether you're latching onto an existing DBR project or launching your own. Um, <clears throat> I think it depends what kind of student you are and how far you want to go, but I think it depends on what drives you too. And so the Dunn dissertation perspective alone, I don't know, that has, that has the, the real chance of killing the spirit of why you're there in the first place, and I would hate to see that happen. So I would say try and balance it. My advice for doing DBR as a grad student is to start early. If you can get a working prototype of something or an idea tested by the end of your first year, you're in good shape to have a second round of it by the time your dissertation comes in your third year. Um, so that's my advice. 